Uh, let's pray real quick. So, Father, we ask that you would bless this time. We ask that you would use it to glorify yourself. We ask that you would use it to stir people's hearts, stir them in this hour for the things that are burning on your heart. And just ask that you would be be with us all, be with the logistics, and um, just give us clarity of mind and, and spirit. Yes. And we commit ourselves to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Yeah. All right. Hey, guys, it's Joel Richardson, and um, we're jumping back in. Uh, I'd say it was several months ago, Jose Diaz and I um, did a little sort of just discussion. Uh, we were talking about some of the things that are going on within GCM, that's Global Catalytic Ministries. It's a um, missions organization that um, I've been working with for the past 10 years. Uh, Jose, how long have you been with GCM? About four years now, actually. I was doing the math yesterday, so four years. Okay, so the past four years. And um, really just the past year as an organization, we've gone through a lot of changes. And um, we've kind of gotten to the place, I would say, right now, here we are, we're recording this in May 2024, where there's just a lot going on that I'm really excited about. Um, yes, there's a lot going on behind the scenes in terms of the gospel going forth in some really difficult areas, some high persecution nations, even some things that we can't even uh, talk about. But one of the things that you've been doing, Jose, that I've been actually really excited about is um, giving leadership to this uh, project, I guess, within GCM called Maranatha Collective. So we've got Claire with us, and I'm going to actually let you introduce Claire and uh, tell everyone a bit about the Maranatha Collective. Yeah, well, always good to be with you, Joel. You're one of my favorite people in the world. So I'll tell you this real quick, just a little bit about Maranatha Collective before I introduce uh, Claire. Essentially, and I don't know how many people know this, that within the GCM, really I'll call it the ecosystem. And this is one of the things I love about GCM, that we're a disciple-making movement, but we're also storytellers. You know, we, we put out content and documentaries, but we've also have a whole uh, expression of GCM and it's kind of mostly been underground, say that kind of tongue in cheek, but it, it, it's been in the background of the GCM world. And we've had a group of about, maybe say 20-ish worship leaders, songwriters, right now predominantly in the West, that that really resonate with the GCM message, really resonate with so much that's happening in the underground church around the world. They resonate with that disciple making message and they want to translate that into songs they want to carry that into music and and above everything the maranatha cry right the oh come lord jesus that longing for the return of the lord and seeing it translated into music and so probably right away uh right maybe three years ago let's say as as i was really getting doing things with gcm we began to gather these worship leaders and a lot of them got connected through various ways whether through your teachings on youtube or the documentary or just you know whatever uh they got connected to gcm and it really resonated deep within them. And I think that's something that's happening, I think, right now all over the West. I think there's, there's, there, the people are hungry for raw, organic, real Christianity. And so the other thing, and I just put this out on the GCM uh, May update, is this is kind of separate but connected because I've been involved in the worship world for a while. I would say probably one of the biggest indictments, if you will, of the worship culture today, it's it's just been it's become uh, overly industrialized. Everything is it's about making a commodity, making worship celebrities, and so I kind of feel like we're like David and the outcast in the cave of Adullam. We're just gathering. We're over the industry. We're longing for priesthood again. Over the whole over industrialized, commercialized worship world, but we resonate with the sheep among wolf mandate, if you will. We resonate with the disciple-making call, with the Maranatha cry. And so we've been gathering uh, for the last few years and really doing just studying the word, writing songs. I mean, these guys are writing songs out of like the prophecies of Daniel. They're writing songs like multiple songs out of like Daniel 7, songs about the millennial kingdom. But then also like writing songs responding to what's happening in Israel, writing songs for like believers in Pakistan, things like that. And so one of the things that we felt like it was time to begin to put out these songs for, for a few reasons. Number one, uh, to stir people up, right? To, to There's something so powerful. We and I talk about music a lot. I don't know about, I don't know if there's any other medium in the world that unifies people like music that gives language and, and, and context and builds culture. So we want to put out these songs to do that. Number two, so we want to awaken the Maranatha cry inside of people. And then number three, all of the funds, everything that we're doing is going to actually fuel two things. Number one, disciple making in the Middle East. 
And then number two is we want to begin to look for, I, I call them Davids. We want to look for those Davids, those worship leaders, those songwriters all over the Middle East, you know, from Saudi Arabia to Iran, to Yemen, to Pakistan. And we want to begin to train and equip them in on, on worship leading, songwriting, things like that. And then we want to help really uh, uh, see their songs, take what God's doing in these communities as the church is being birthed in a lot of these places, take what the Lord is doing and record that and put it out there. So this is, we really view this as this beautiful merger between the West and the East as these songs are being birthed in the West. The goal is to see those songs then awaken songs in the East. And we want to see worship come out of the East. We want to see what does worship sound like in Mecca? What does worship sound like in Pakistan, in Iraq? And then the goal is, is as you guys are praying for these nations, as you're praying for Saudi Arabia, as you're praying for Afghanistan, imagine praying for those nations with the soundtrack of those nations in the background. And you're, you're you know, I, I don't know about you, like sometimes I love praying to music uh, and to have the soundtrack of these nations. So that's really the heartbeat of all of this is, is I view this if you will, as like the soundtrack of the underground church movement of what's happening around the world. And so this month, so depending on when you watch this, Tuesday, May 28th, we're putting out our first single. And it's uh, it's actually somebody I've known her entire life. She, she's 17. She lives in Manchester, England. I'll introduce Claire here in a minute. But um, we wanted to do something different. We have a lot of amazing songwriters, people that are on here. But we said, man, we want to take our youngest songwriter. Uh, and so Claire's our youngest. She's 16 when she joined. She's 17 now. She started writing songs songs last year. She's, I think she wrote about 10 songs last year. And so Claire is uh, the first person that's going to be coming out with a single. It's called Long to Behold. And it's available on all streaming platforms, Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music. It's everywhere. And really, and I'll let Claire explain the song here in a minute, but it's again, carrying that, that Maranatha heart cry. So Claire, I know this is probably a little nerve wracking, 17. We've just like thrown you in the deep end, but you've, you've killed it with the song. So welcome. Uh, say hi to everyone. Yes. Thank you. Hi. I'm so honored to be here. And it's just been such an amazing journey, I guess, like such an incredible learning experience for me, especially like I've never done anything like this before. So even just to be given the opportunity to do this and learn so much along the way and to be able to partner with this ministry that, um, just has such a heart for Maranatha and disciple making across the world is just like amazing. So honored to be a part. Now, and I know this answer, but I want them to hear this. And probably not before last year, the, the whole concept of like the return of the Lord, Maranatha, that wasn't probably a real prevalent theme in your life, would you say? Oh yeah, for sure. I had like heard about, you know, Maranatha in the word before. And actually even before I kind of joined uh, Maranatha Collective. The book of Revelation was always my the favorite book of the Bible for me. Um, I didn't really have a lot of language to describe like why or what it was, but I just knew that something in it like gripped me. I just feel like the return of Jesus is just like such a great source of hope, you know, for everyone. Yeah, after joining, I think it just gave me a lot of language. I'm um, an understanding behind what Maranatha actually meant, what the return of Jesus actually means for us, um, and what it will look like. That's awesome. I'm just curious, because uh, I don't know if I've actually ever asked you this, how, I'm trying to figure out how to frame this question, how important or necessary is it to, to see that theme in worship songs? I feel like we're starting to see that kind of come out more, and, and it's kind of been a real niche thing, niche, I don't know how you say it, niche or niche, whatever, but but the I, I feel like there's such an urgency, a necessity to carry the storyline of the Lord's return in songs. Like I think of Joel, your books, how much of an impact they've had on people through reading the books, but I think there's something, again, powerful about music and songs and carrying the language, carrying the storyline. Just love to hear from me as a songwriting perspective, as a worship leader, the significance of carrying the storyline of the Lord's return in song. Yeah, that's a such a great question. Um, well, I think everyone like resonates with music and they resonate with songs like all over the world. And I feel like that's something that God kind of gave us as even a gift to be able to resonate with music um, and like remember music and lyrics and melodies. And so I think that when we kind of carry this message of Maranatha through songs, 
it allows people to connect with it better than if it was just like taught to them, you know, in some cases. And it just like the simplicity of it being in songs makes it accessible for people to just, at, you know, the click of a button, they can hear this message of Maranatha and it can stir something up in them. Um, and I think it just allows for almost a greater understanding of what it is and even like a spark of curiosity to, you know, start in them just from hearing like a song that's oh, okay this is a song I like music what's this talking about and what is this making making me feel yeah I think that's important just how music is kind of built into us as a you know desire and how that can be linked with what God's trying to say in God's own heart yeah no I I uh I love that and um I, I and I think one thing that you said that I think is so important and Joel I don't know if I'd love to hear any thoughts if you had on this is the the significance of demystifying the storyline of the Lord's return simplifying it making it more tangible because I think that's probably one of the biggest lies of the enemy or one of the biggest resistors is pe that people don't want to touch that subject at all it's because they feel like it's too difficult it's too complicated. It's fear attached to it. But when you actually engage with it, it's the most beautiful, hopeful, romantic even storyline in human history. And that's why I think, again, bringing it to song form, to music form, I think it even awakens some of that hopeful romance uh, that's a part of the story. Which, by the way, I, that's one of the things I love about your song, Claire. It's not this heavy, depressing song. It's this hopeful, joyful, longing expectancy for the return of the Lord. You know, um, one thing I'll, I'll say about that is, let's say we're talking about just the gospel itself, your average Christian, you know, what what is it that's motivating them? And I've heard this discussion a million times over the years, are, should we be more motivated by pleasing the Lord? and our love for him, um, or should we be motivated by fear of hell? And I would say, biblically speaking, there's some legitimacy to both sides, but it's the mature believer that um, moves on from fear of punishment to just a healthy love relationship with the Lord. Well, similarly, with regard to the end times, yes, the end times, for most Christians out there, they think of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, sort of all sorts of terrifying things. They'll say things like the end of the world, but biblically speaking, the end times, it's actually the end of this corrupt, exhausting, uh, wicked, evil age. You know, it's the end of things that drive us all crazy, like corrupt politicians, getting old, premature death, suicide, divorce, addiction. Answer. Yeah. Answer. You know, all of these things. It's the end of those things. And it's the dawn. It's the beginning of a brand new age. The Bible calls it the renewal of all things, the restoration, the regeneration, the resurrection, the kingdom of God, you know. And so when we uh, simplify that story of the end times and just tell it as it's intended to be told, it's not to say the Antichrist and, you know, the tribulation, those things aren't relevant, but like a birth, which is exactly what the Bible uses, the analogy of a birth, um, the focus is never on the birth pains. The focus is on the baby and yeah. preparing the room for the baby, you know, preparing for life after the baby. And likewise, I think for any, you know, balanced, healthy Christian, it's not primarily about fear. It's not primarily about, you know, nuclear bombs going off and Mad Max and, you know, the end of the world and dystopian society and the collapse of America, you know, all the different things that people talk about, or it's, it's really about the coming of the Lord and it's the fulfillment of every uh, every shred of longing and yearning throughout the entire Bible and really of every human heart. So it's it blesses me that that's being translated. Um, the simplicity and the beauty, as you said, even the romance of the message, um, the degree to which it resonates with all of us. I love that that's being translated into into songs because it you know it's one thing to listen to you know some you know somebody teach on YouTube. It's another thing to be driving in the car and listening and singing and letting that message sort of seep into you and marinating in it and so forth. So I love I love it. I love what you guys are doing. Yeah. One, one thought, I don't know, uh, when you were talking about the the birth pains and the birthing process, I think about my wife every time, and I don't know if a, a lot of women are like this, maybe it's just Dana because she's a worship leader, but every time she went to give birth, she wanted to have like a playlist, a soundtrack, essentially to just to like prep the process. And maybe that's a more of a modern thing with technology and streaming and all that. I mean, I can't picture like somebody in the 80s bringing a boom box or like a <laughs> an LP playlist or, you know, to the hospital, but, but there was something about music that made the laboring easier. And, and, and there were specific songs that she wanted even playing while she was laboring when the baby came. And, uh, and it's crazy. Like my daughter, she, she had a, for a while, a connection to a specific worship leader because my wife played it all the time. 
while she was pregnant, during the laboring process, and when she gave birth, it, it was so a part of that. I kind of view these songs that we're getting ready to put out almost like songs. I don't know if this is a weird analogy, but like songs for the birth pain process, songs for the laboring process that makes, because I'm thinking not just now, I'm thinking in the future, I'm thinking in the great tribulation, as the church is enduring, as we're, you know, as we're, as John says, is we're patiently tribulating, right? The patient endurance of the saints, a, a soundtrack that is part of that patient enduring, that's part of that process, that's again, awakening the romance, awakening the hope, awakening the love and awakening the longing in the heart of the believer. And this is one of the things I love about your song, Claire, is that, you know, you, you, you use that, well, the title of it, Long to Behold, and you have the verse on there, We Long to Behold You. And that's really the climax or the, or the theme of the song is that the, the prayer for the return of the Lord isn't a prayer from just a heart that wants to escape the bad. Though I think, I mean, there's times, I'm not gonna lie, I, I was reading a headline today and my first response was like, oh Lord, come back. You know, there's enough happening, but I love that your song isn't from that posture. It's from the posture of actually longing to see Jesus. It's 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 the response of a lovesick heart. It's the response of a heart that desires God. And that really, I believe that's like the fuel of the Maranatha cry. I don't know if you can take a couple of minutes and speak on that. Yeah. So just like on the heart of the song, I guess, is that what you're yeah. asking? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think after even, you know, joining Maranatha Collective and learning more about what it means and all that that I mentioned earlier, um, I think it does when you when you know more about it, something in you is just a hunger is awakened. And so I feel like translating that to song kind of looks like the simplicity of just coming before God and being like, I long to behold you. Like, it's that simple. It's just, um, Lord, I want to see you. I want to see you face to face. I want you to come back. Um, I think even awakening that idea of hope that we've mentioned a couple times, um, that there is hope for us in the return of the Lord, that there is hope for justice. He will bring justice. He will come and restore all things. So that hope for restoration, the hope for peace and um, saying like, yes, Lord, I long to behold you. Lord, I long for you to come back um, and bring, you know, and bring us hope. I long for you to come back and restore all things. I long for you to come back and bring justice. And so I think in that cry of long to behold um, is like so many other things layered under that that come with the return of the Lord. Um, not just that we would see him, but that we would see all these things that are promised to us um, in the Bible. And just even that like unifying cry of not just me, but like we do as a body of Christ, as a body of believers, we are longing to see your face. We are longing for your return and we are yeah. longing for you to make all things new. That's awesome. Awesome. I got two more questions for you. One is, so one of the things that's really neat about this is you're 17. You are technically, are you, are you still a part of Gen Z? Are you still considered Gen Z at 17? Okay. So Gen Z, Joel, I don't know if you know this, is the most biblically illiterate generation in American history. So since the founding of the country, most biblically illiterate generation, I know people in Gen Z that have no idea who Adam and Eve are. That's like, for me, that's like insane. Even when I wasn't a believer, like I knew how Adam and Eve were and Moses. How important would you say, and, and it's a two-part question, connecting your generation to the Maranatha messages and I think also connecting them to the underground church world, what God's doing in the Middle East, what God is doing in Israel, that whole narrative, that whole storyline. And maybe not just the importance, but what does that look like? Getting your generation connected, interested, open to that whole world. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing around Gen Z that's mentioned a lot is that we're very connected to the world, which I would kind of disagree with that you know obviously we have all these forms of media and social media and so in some ways you know we're connected to others but I think we're still very closed off almost like narrow-minded to what is in our world still you know and so I think you know songs like this and ministries like GCM are widening our worldview of what's actually going on in the bigger picture of things and kind of awakening Gen Z to the fact that like the world isn't just like me, you know, it's yeah. not like just my experience. It's not just what's going on. Um, on in like um, the Western world, but there's so much more that's happening. And there's a bigger picture that we're a part of, like, it's not just now, but it's actually there's so much more going on and even just awakening them um, to that, that there's more that you're living for. And there's more um, potential that you have, and you have a greater calling that's not limited to just what's around you and what's on your screen. So 
I love that. I love that. And just with that, you know, one of the things, and I talked about this in the beginning and Claire, you know, this, you know, our heart has been to really see this almost as like the soundtrack, if you will, or a soundtrack to the underground church world, right? We want to give, and, and well, let me say it like this, when we've done some writing exercises like this, we want to take the experiences of a lot of our disciple makers that are in some of the hardest, darkest places of the world. And we want to bring their stories to life through these songs, right? We want to uh, uh, capture the cry of their heart. We want to capture the reality of their obedience to Jesus. And we want to put that out there uh, to the world. And then number two, eventually, you know, as with songs like this, we have more songs coming out with the money that comes in. We want to just dump that back in and um, raise up these worship leaders in the Middle East. And you got to meet one uh, uh, recently, you know, who shared his story on, on the group. And we want to take those kind of voices and highlight them and bring their songs out there. Talk a little bit for you as a Westerner, uh, as a worship leader, what it's been like to be connected. You know, again, this isn't just like some random songwriting group. We're not doing this for the sake of doing it. We're doing this for the greater purpose. We're doing this uh, connect to a, a whole storyline. You know, we, we had a meeting a few weeks ago. I was like, you know, we're all on the same team, whether it's Claire in Manchester or our disciple maker in Saudi Arabia. We're like, we're, we're together, working together to see Jesus receive the full reward of his sufferings, to see Jesus receive his inheritance. Take a couple of minutes, talk about what that's like for you being a part of this whole bigger picture narrative in the Middle East. Yeah, um, that's something that I just have loved about, you know, being a part of this is knowing that there are other people outside of even, you know, any experience that you could imagine or that I could even bring my mind to comprehend that are experiencing such different things than me, but are so unified in the things I believe and the things I'm believing for and who I'm looking to and just being aware of what's going on yeah. kind of, you know, in that bigger picture, in the picture of what God's doing almost has just um, made me realize even more how big God is and how he's so much bigger than I could have imagined and how he's working in um, so many different ways that I wasn't even aware of before. And just being connected, you know, to the underground church and, you know, what's happening. It's just encouraging in our faith because it's like, you know, if they can do it over there, then I should have no problem, <laughs> you know? Um, they're doing, you know, so much. And so I think it's just inspiring as well to people over here in, in the West um, to step it up, I guess. Yeah. But. I just, I'm, I'm in, I just, I love what I'm hearing. Can I jump in? I, I want to ask yeah. you a question, Jose. So, okay, so we've got Claire. Claire is, um, she's in the UK. Um, you mentioned. By the way, if you hear her American accent, her family are missionaries in the UK. I just realized I forgot to mention that part. Uh, but yeah, her folks are Americans, so. Um, she speaks proper English. No, just kidding. So uh, American. But you know, you mentioned like raising up voices of worship leaders, for example, in Saudi Arabia or Iraq or, you know, different nations. One of the things that I'm excited about is you, it's a very it's a difficult time to be alive, I think. You know, ask any kid Gen Z, you know, technology and all these things. There's a explosion of anxiety and depression and all these different things. But there are obviously some good things that technology brings. Um, but ultimately it's the decentralization of everything, which is a decentralized approach is, has always been GCM's um, discipleship, you know, approach. DMM is a very decentralized model. Um, but what I'm thinking of is, you know, nowadays TV networks, you know, the old networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and even the big Hollywood studios, they're all struggling because everyone now is a filmmaker. Everyone has a pretty high quality camera in their hand. People are making their own videos and therefore, or everyone, you know, is competing with everyone. Well, similarly now, you know, let's say even just 20 years ago or 15 years ago, it would have been very difficult to record uh, pretty good high quality music in Iraq. Nowadays, virtually everyone has decent, sufficient um, technology just on their phones and with some of the different programs and so forth. So anyway, all that to say is I'm excited. There is some positive things to technology, but just tell me like what you have in the hopper right now in terms of voices and and different folks rising up out of the Middle East itself. I knew there was one uh, worship leader, I won't even say which country, um, where he's from, but absolutely sang with 
the flavor and the style well, it was iran yeah. um with the flavor and the style of iran and it was absolutely beautiful and i had really hoped that we could get to the place of um recording him but share a little bit about some of what's yeah. going on yeah. there at least no really good joel actually so one of them is a, a worship leader he's an iranian worship leader he, he uh he's actually in the states now we just did um probably a few weeks back an instagram live with him but it's amazing about this guy his job growing up he was the guy that sang the muslim call to prayer in iran uh so that's how he learned how to sing uh encounter the lord as a kickboxer in turkey and then uh uh somebody gave him a word that he was supposed to be a worship leader and he you know his only background in music up in this point was singing the muslim call to prayer and so uh uh, uh, he starts writing worship songs and really sharing his testimony. She's talking about God being father. Uh, uh, and so he's and he records everything in Farsi, uses Farsi instruments, Farsi musicians, uh, Farsi musicians, and they've got a network of house churches in Iran that we're working with to train and, 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 and we're going to be working with their network. But what's crazy is uh, it's on YouTube and it's gone viral in Iran, this guy's music. Only in Iran right now. Nobody knows about him in the States. And so uh, Pete, like th there was a testimony about a kid found his music and was playing it at his house. His parents heard it, didn't know what it was, but it it like touched them. And uh, he quickly turned it off. You know, his Muslim family quickly turned it off when he realized that they heard and they're like, well, what are you listening to? And he was afraid to tell them because he knew it wasn't, it wasn't Muslim. He knew it was Christian. And he told them and they said, play it. Because we've never heard anything like this before. So the, they started playing it and the entire family came to the Lord, just listening to these, this guy's songs. And then there's taxi drivers in Iran that just play his music. People will come into the taxis and encounter the Lord. And he's talking about things like the love of God. He's talking about God being father uh and so we're excited we want to put out uh, some of his music for you guys to hear and to hear his testimony and to hear his story another guy that i'll highlight is um he's this, this worship leader in pakistan he's just like prophetic worship leader guy i haven't met him yet but our team knows him this guy will sit down and do six to eight hour long songs just prophetic spontaneous you know we think we've got like the the corner market on like spontaneous prophetic worship there are guys in these nations and they don't know the rules they don't know the movements they don't know any of the mega places they're just they're just davids in the hillside of these places this one guy again he's just the david out there in pakistan with his guitar and he is he's like does these like six hour long songs eight hour long songs and again we don't know him but a lot of the believers there like he is a major major voice and so there's a story our main disciple maker there uh, i forget what happened something like super discouraging persecution uh, stuff coming down from the government and one of our leaders was there and he said you know i just need to hear my favorite worship leader i just i just need to hear it and he puts this guy on it completely refreshed rejuvenated this leader my buddy who, who doesn't speak the language had no idea what the guy was saying but could immediately feel the presence of the lord and so uh, he, he's again a soundtrack uh, and a voice of encouragement if you will to many of the disciple makers in and across pakistan so we want to take him we want to record him and put his music out there and then you know as we're putting these songs out we're not just going to put them out just throw them out there we want to tell the stories of who these guys are uh, the stories behind the songs we want to match you know their testimony and, and just again stories of what god's doing in these nations with the songs so those are two that i'll highlight now uh we have a, a, again an amazing iranian worship leader and then we have a pakistani worship leader i love it i love the fact too uh that they're not just simply learning how to uh imitate you know whether whether it be hillsong or vineyard or you know whatever yeah. matt redman or some you know new popular worship leader that they listen to as you said they're just they have their own you know they're just david's out in the countryside and this has been one of the values of gcm yeah. And DMM, which is the disciple making method, if you will, or movement model is really trusting the Holy Spirit to guide new believers. Oftentimes when we disciple people, we just try to give them the new rules. And, and particularly coming out of a Muslim background, uh, believers, you know, they're looking for rules. They're like, okay, I'm giving up these old rules or the new rules. And we as humans have a tendency to just want to give them the rules. Okay, you know, don't don't spit, don't cuss, don't chew tobacco, like whatever, you know, the rules. And I love giving them the scriptures and letting the Holy Spirit often guide them into these things. It's a very biblical concept. One thing, let me just say this, because I want to make sure I mention this before, before we wrap up. Um, as I said, 
um, as a as a ministry, uh, it's been a blessing to see where GCM has gone the past year to to get to a place of an incredibly healthy um, ministry. I have so deeply appreciated uh, the work that the leaders have done, Mike Patino, the CEO in particular, really just to create a healthy organization. It just feels like we're just perched. We've grown dramatically, but it feels like we're just perched and ready to really launch into something. Um, the one thing that we have not done the past year or so is really reach out um, and appeal to the body of Christ. Um, our support is, is significantly down because we really have not been actively um, uh, recruiting new supporters or you know inviting folks to partner with us. So I just want to set that before anyone who is watching. Um, in order to make this all happen, we do need we do need more supporters. Um, as I said, we've we've really kind of just almost taken a season off um, from really, you know, sort of reaching out to the body. So money is neither here nor there, but it sure does help get you there. So let me ask you this question, Jose. Um, okay, we're going to put up the links so that folks yep. go to the new single to listen to yep. the new single that Claire um, did. Do we want to play a little clip here before on the video or do we want to just put up the links and let folks find it on their platforms it's up to you we could do either i'm going to leave it up to the editors i'm going to leave it up to the editors afterwards because we're going to take this we're just recording a zoom session yeah. we're going to send it to the editors have have them sort of put it together but at the very least we will put all the info up yeah um so folks can go again whether it's spotify apple music this that or the other thing it'll be on all the different platforms is there anything else that you either of you guys wanted to um to throw out before we wrap it up i'm good i just thank you joel for your time always appreciate getting to see your face all right claire thank you so much for what you're doing we're really blessed um it's always encouraging sometimes as we uh as we old folks get even older and crustier we we start complaining about the young generations the gen z's you know i i joked the other day on twitter i said i just want to live long enough to see gen z get old enough to start complaining about the next generation what is the next generation even called generation alpha alpha yeah so to see folks like you claire going oh, those alpha Alpha. Those kids are lazy. All they do is play video games or whatever. I don't know. But uh, it's just part of part of uh, getting old, I guess. But thank you sincerely. Thank you for what you're doing. It's a real blessing, blessing to my heart. And, and I'm really grateful, Jose, for you taking the leadership and sort of discipling some of these young worship leaders. I know your heart just burns with that call to see David's raised up. What's a female version of David called? I, I think of, I've said like Davidette. <laughs> David, well, that would, yeah, David, that's almost offensive. If you say, um, Rush Limbaugh used to say as a joke, just he would, instead of a reporter, he would say a reporter at. So, so we got to find something better than a David at. How about like a, a Davida? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little more, yeah, a little more Latin. So anyway, but super appreciate your heart just again to raise up worship leaders. I really do genuinely believe that the Maranatha cry is much more than a, it's not something that anyone owns. It's genuinely a cry that the Lord himself is birthing in the body. And you can't have a movement without music. And so I love that that's just happening, you know, organically. We're seeing, you know, throughout history, um, whenever there was a genuine movement, there was both physical art, visual art, and and music that went along with it. So it's it's beautiful to be part of it, and I really appreciate you guys. Appreciate you, man. Mm -hmm.